I'm going to try to slip in one. I'm sorry, Dennis. We're going to try to slip in one more question. This lady here, I think, has a unique perspective, literally and figuratively, about Area 51. My name is Barbara Sheehan. I'm from the Groom Rhine. We thought that we owned all the desert out there because we've been there since 1889. And were we surprised when the AEC came in with the bombs? The Air Force had been there before, and they used to fly over us with their bombers and their fighter pilots, and they'd shoot the targets over camp, and we put up with that. We thought the war was all over with, and then lo and behold, one morning, the family got knocked out of bed just about, had no idea what was going on. And so my brother got up one morning early with his camera, and he took a picture of the fireball. We were within nine miles of the bombs going off. And so he sent the, 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 the pictures into Kodak, and they sent out the FBI. <laughs> they did not know that we were there. The Air Force knew, but the AEC did not know that we were there. So they came out in, in mass, needless to say, to, to our mining camp. And my dad had a mining operation there for a long time. So, like I said, we thought the Groom Lake was ours. We used to go down and chase jackrabbits and coyotes all over the lake. You could roller skate on it. It was wonderful. I haven't been on that lake since 1952. I'd love to go on that lake, but we, we can't go on the lake anymore. Well, your family still has property. I mean, we you can still see have... it. We still have the property. We are like, like a little island in the middle of the test site, and we can go out there, uh, but we have to get permission to go, and we don't know a thing that's going on down at Area 51, nor do we want to. Surely they would allow Channel 8 to come with a camera, would they? <laughs> I just wanted you to know what Area 51 is like from the civilian side. Uh, we come, and, you know, they let us in, God bless them. Uh, we have to go through a guard, and they have the great big machine guns all ready to shoot us. There's old ladies going out there, with, and they're going to shoot us. But anyway, we get through, and then we go up to our mine. They have all kinds of cabins and everything. We've got our old dump trucks still ready to run. If we could, 1939 dump truck and 1940 dump truck still run. And um, anyway, we have our old mine that we love very, very much. The family still goes out there whenever they can. Um, but we can't stay out there. We can't live out there. But it's, it's ours. Why don't you join the Air Force? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, Ma'am, I was going to ask you a question. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'll, I'll get up here where I see you. Uh, recently, I did a little thing in one of our newsletters about the uh, the groom mine. We used to walk up there out of boredom on the weekends or something. And the great-granddaughter wrote me a letter just recently, and you sent me some of the diary writings of Dan, the, her great-grandpa was buried there. And, and we've been, so we've been corresponding back and forth, and uh, I put her with Mary Pulaski with the UNLV that's doing the Cold War War History Program, uh, and now they're corresponding. Oh, so, nice. Because uh, she sent me a lot of material about how the, when the, the, Fallout would come down. Metal would actually be hitting on the tin roofs of oh, the buildings yeah. and stuff mm -hmm. from the from the shot towers and whatnot. Sure so, so the close connection we're talking to they you. Agree the, with. They would they would set off the bombs when the wind was blowing towards us, not towards Las Vegas, but towards us, because if Las Vegas got it, they we'd be in, or they'd be in trouble. And so it's more right right over us. It was rain. It's hot, hot course. stuff. I don't know. And my dad, he would let the the boys that would that would go out after the bomb was, was set off, the boys would go out from our camp. They were living in, in our cabins, and they would go out and check to see what was done. You know, boys have got to see what's got what happens when you blow something up. You know, well that's what they would do. They would go out and see what happened, and then they would come back, take off their, the, the coveralls, and leave them, and then they would go back to town. So my dad would pick up all the coveralls and throw them in the trash barrel and burn them. So I don't know how we're all still. <laughs> we aren't all of us alive, but two of us are still are. Anyway, it was a wonderful, wonderful life out there. Thanks for sharing those stories. Thank you. I'm going to take one more question from the other room. Uh, question if you can hear us, Leonard, Leonard Britt. Hi, I wanted to thank you all on the panel very much for your participation, and uh, I treasure your stories. I'm very honored to hear all your stories. And I guess I'd like to ask, in parting, um, 50 years from now, People will be sitting here listening to the stories of those people out there now. Uh, do you have any 
words of wisdom for those who will be taking your place on this panel 50 years from now. God willing, I'll still be here to hear them. Can you guarantee the invitation? <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. Very good. I hope that will open it up. Godspeed. I want to thank our panelists. Uh, it was a fascinating conversation. And we really appreciate all of you being here and sharing these insights and, and experiences. And I uh, want to remind you all that there's another panel tomorrow afternoon. And I uh, want to thank the Atomic uh, Testing Museum for hosting this event. It was fabulous. I hope we can do it again real soon. Thank you all for coming. Yeah, that was probably a unique uh,